Thank you very much, John. Thank you uh, very much to the Supers for the invitation to come and speak today. And it is, uh, for me, actually an opportunity to say thank you to you and to all of your members, superintendents, and also the uh, officers and staff that work for you across the country for the work that you've done over the last few years under what we know is growing pressure on our police forces. In the short time, you've seen your numbers substantially cut and the additional pressures on each of you grow to fill that gap. So it is a tribute to you and to your leadership and organisation that policing across the country has continued to provide great service to communities. I'd like also to pay tribute to uh, Derek Barnett, your former president, for the work uh, that he uh, did very much to be your voice, obviously somebody with a long history in uh, everything from community policing to a lot of work across the country, but also who commanded great respect and authority in his work and his role uh, as uh, the president of the Superintendents uh, Association. But also to thank your new president, Irene, for the invitation to speak today and also for the work that she's already been doing, the championing of neighbourhood policing and the work on mental health, speaking only today, but also for being the first woman to take up the full-time role. And I join Irene in pushing for more women to take up senior positions, not just in policing, but also across public life. Irene, of course, keeps us all in touch with uh, her Barracks Last Twitter feed. And I have tried actually to, uh, to join the Twitter feed and to keep track of the conference and the Supers, Supers 2013 uh, Twitter feed. It is, um, I find it very interesting actually how many police officers across the country have embraced Twitter and are communicating by Twitter. Some of you may have heard me um, confess before that I am not the greatest of uh, tweeters. One of my early experiences was um, I'd actually just jumped off the train, got in the car, and I was checking my BlackBerry just before setting off and discovered that suddenly my replies and mentions seems to have shot up and I seem to be trending on Twitter and I thought maybe the Labour Party press office has put something out in my name uh, and in fact instead I had managed to send out a tweet which just said her go 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 her go 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 her go 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 and um, the retweets and responses to this some had been uh, sympathetic such as uh, people who had retweeted it saying, yes, my handbag tweets too. And others uh, were rather less sympathetic, and the most common response, in fact, had been a, a sort of tweet which simply involved retweeting my tweet with a comment at the end, something along the lines of, what a change to have a politician talk sense. <laughs> so with that firmly in mind, and I know how sceptical many in the police often are about whether politicians will talk sense about policing. I want to talk a bit today about some of the issues that we see as being challenges for policing, some of the differences that we do have with the government and the government's approach, and what a positive vision for policing might draw upon. As you know, we disagree with the government over the scale and pace of the cuts that they introduced. We argued from the start that 20% cuts to policing went too far and too fast. We argued that it was bad for the economy, part of an economic approach which delayed economic growth for three years, and bad for policing too. We would have supported 12% cuts, and that was the level that the HMIC had said could be sustained. But instead, we've got 15,000 police officers going by 2015, and forces have already lost 14,000. So faced with those cuts, I do pay tribute to the work the police have been doing, working more smartly, using intelligence to even greater effect, targeting resources where they have the greatest impact, and continuing to learn from best practice to innovate and improve the quality of policing work. And the continued falls in some kinds of recorded crime reflects that targeted work the police are continuing to do. But let's be honest, the service is also being seriously stretched in many areas. And Theresa May said there would be no impact on frontline policing from these cuts. And we just know that is not true. You will know the impact that cuts are having in your area. But we look at some of the figures. Response units have been cut. And 999 response times have increased. In some areas, it's taking 20% longer on average to get to nighttime emergency calls. 
Neighbourhood policing teams are being merged with response units or given other responsibilities and administration to do, as other teams have been cut. And as your president has warned, this means that neighbourhood policing has increasingly been seen as a nice-to-have rather than a core part of policing. And the HMIC have ha said the current approach risks eroding neighbourhood policing. Specialist domestic violence units have been cut. So even though the number of domestic violence cases reported to the police is increasing, there has been a 13% drop in the number of cases being referred to the CPS. In some forces, it's far worse, with 37% fewer charges being brought. And the number of convictions, after increasing for five years up to 2010-11, has fallen since the cuts started. And then overall, 27,000 fewer crimes solved in the last year before the cuts started. So let's be honest about the consequence of the government's 20% cut in policing. With the best will in the world, it means a service doing less for less. Less justice and protection for victims of domestic violence, fewer crimes being solved, more crucial minutes till the 999 call receives a response, and bluntly, more criminals getting away with it. Now, the government has pointed to falling crime statistics as a justification. And we must always welcome reductions in recorded crime. We must welcome the reductions in homicides, the reductions in burglaries. But my view is that Theresa May and Damien Green are still being very complacent about this and are still out of touch with many people's experience. For example, out of touch with the shopkeepers in one home county's town who told me that they'd stopped reporting shoplifting to the police because the town centre team had been cut and it would take too long for officers from neighbouring areas to arrive to do anything about it. Or out of touch with the women's refuges who told me that they were dealing with more cases of domestic violence as financial and housing strains and stresses were increasing relationship tensions too. Or out of touch with the victims who want justice but see their case being less likely to get to court. And also out of touch with the, the changing nature of crime, changing technology, changing lifestyles, and the changing patterns of crime that the police are now having to deal with. Let me give you three areas where I think that the government is failing to respond in the way that they need to. Crimes such as fraud, particularly carried out online. Fraud recorded crime is already going up by 30%, but we know that's the tip of the iceberg, with things like credit card fraud often not being reported to the police at all. We know that law enforcement agencies are not yet equipped to deal with what is likely to be a continuing, growing online crime, but I don't think the government is showing the leadership we need to sort it out. Nor do I think there is a strong enough strategy to deal with the ever-growing problems of mental health, which are creating ever-greater strains for policing. Nor do I think the government is doing enough to respond to things like the growing awareness of child exploitation, for example, the historic cases where victims are finally rightly building the confidence to come forward, but the awful two current emerging cases of grooming and gang exploitation and the growing phenomenon of online child abuse. In each of three, these three areas alone, problems are growing and the police are responding. The emergency service of last resort, they have to. And the HMIC are responding and focusing on these issues too. But we know in any of those three areas, be it mental health, be it online crime, be it child abuse, the police can't solve these problems alone. And you need government leadership to bring in other agencies, be it the NHS, councils, schools, communities, businesses, and to set the agenda. And it is my concern that from the Home Secretary in each of those areas, we have had almost nothing. But I think it's also more of a problem than that. It's not simply a lack of leadership on ta tackling problems around changing nature of crime, but it's also reforms that have caused greater problems. The research for the Stevens review that we set up has shown the low levels of morale across the force. Over half of officers, 40% of police staff say they're considering leaving policing with over 90% responding, feeling they were not valued by the government. I think the handling of the pay and pension reforms has been damaging. The chaotic reforms and reorganisations, the disorganised replacement of the NPIA, replacing soccer by a renamed NCA with progress slow, and the well-intentioned and right establishment of the National College of Policing, but yet potentially undermined by having no secured funding or direction for the future. Problems too like probation and offender management being contracted out. And of course the challenges of the way that the government has introduced police and crime commissioners. Now those were the Home Secretary's flagship reforms, which they promised would secure and they quote, 
a strong democratic mandate from the ballot box. But instead, in practice, only one in eight people turned out to vote, and it cost £100 million to hold those elections in November. And the PCCs and the chief constables since then have had complex challenges to address because their jobs and responsibilities weren't properly defined by the government. And in my view, the checks and balances on what they do are not properly in place. I don't believe either there has been sufficient of a national strategy to help the police make savings, particularly around procurement. And on new technology, the IT procurement plans that they set out seem to have completely collapsed. And we've also seen a cutback in the use of some existing technology, with CCTV being reduced, DNA being destroyed, forensics facing all kinds of problems and ending up costing more, and a stalemate on plans for communication data. So I think the truth is that the police are doing their best to innovate and continue to modernize, continue to respond to changing patterns of crime and community concerns. But the government should be making it easier to do that and not making it harder or putting obstacles in the way. So what then is the alternative that I would like to see? I think you need effective partnership. Yes, that means police and communities, police and other agencies, but also the police and the government in order to make it easier, not harder, for the police to do their job. We need a vision, a positive vision, of policing for the 21st century and also a hard-headed practical look at the changes needed to deliver that. And not one that's just drawn up by civil servants or politicians in isolation, but drawn up with the police, communities, experts and parliament working together. The Police Superintendents Association long called for a thorough review of policing. The government didn't set one up. We asked Lord Stevens to set up an independent commission into the future of policing in the 21st century. And he's drawn on expertise, not just in British policing, but also from around the world, best in new academic research, evidence from business, local government as well, and reached out to over 30,000 officers and staff, surveys, evidence from officers uh, and other organisations. They're due to report next month, and I don't want to preempt their conclusions and the work that they are doing, but I can tell you the areas that they are looking at is around what is the positive vision of policing for the 21st century, what is the new compact between the police and communities that we need, what are the structures that are needed to underpin that, the importance of neighbourhood policing, but also the value of work at Borough Command and the challenges of regional and national structures that we need to deal with different kinds of crime. They're looking, too, at the standards and improving quality, the potential of the College of Policing, but also at what kind of intervention is needed when things go wrong, as we know they did, whether it be around Hillsborough or hacking or other kinds of problems. And I've argued in the past of the need to make sure, in order to maintain confidence in the excellent work that policing does across the country, you also need an effective system to respond when things go wrong. And I don't believe that the IPCC is currently effective at doing that. They're looking, too, at accountability and the future around police and crime commissioners. And again, we've made clear we believe that reforms are needed in this area and we want to ask them for their views. Around partnership working, the importance of the relationship around crime prevention as well as bringing criminals to justice. And also the need to make savings in a strategic way and the challenges from new technology. You have, I think, uh, Chris Gregg, uh, speaking to you about the Stevens Review later on to make sure any final feedback is properly considered in the report's conclusions. But I just wanted to highlight just a couple of the themes and uh, issues today. In particular, the need for that positive vision of policing in the 21st century. Policing is a public service and needs to be about more than just crime. It always has been. It's about keeping communities safe, maintaining public confidence in the rule of law. It's so much more than a narrow vision of reactive firefighting that sometimes too often people treat it as. When a victim is scarred by a terrible crime, the police can restore that person's faith in society by ensuring that justice is done and that that person is cared for. Policing means helping people who are suffering from trauma, helping communities understand how to prevent crime, making our roads safer, preventing social fracturing and division, making the vulnerable feel confident on our streets. 
And I think we have to reaffirm that wider vision of the police as the public, the public as the police, that Peel began so many years ago. And we need as part of that to reaffirm the value of, pol of neighbourhood policing as the bedrock of police work. Getting Bobbies out onto the beat, it was the best of policing's history and the best of its future. It was one of, I believe, the Labour government's most important reforms alongside the Crime and Disorder Act. It brings the police closer to the public and the public closer to the police. And we saw very recently in the West Midlands how crucial neighbourhood policing can be to solving the most serious of crimes and keeping the public safe. When the counter-terror team were pursuing a suspect for the murder of Mohammed Salim and the attacks on mosques, in the end, it was neighbourhood officers using their local knowledge and connections and experience and diligence who actually tracked the suspect down. And so the review needs to look at what the structures should be, how you build from that neighbourhood policing as that bedrock, but also how you get the right structures at every level in order to meet the challenges for modern crime. And it's looking too at some of the issues around the quality of the workforce for the future, which we all know is crucial. We all know we need greater flexibility in the workforce, more ability to train and retrain. We know too that in the end, the best ideas for the future of modern policing will come from individual officers themselves, and we need to make sure that they are empowered to do an even better job. But there's two things that I think it should not mean. First of all, it shouldn't mean in future reliance only on graduate and academic entry to policing without a vocational route, because that will not deliver the wide range of skills and talents that policing needs. And it also must not mean senior officers without the experience or training that they need. And I want to say something about the government's proposal for direct entry to superintendents. Because everyone supports fast tracking for talented recruits and accelerated promotion. But 15 to 18 months to be a superintendent? 15 months training to decide how a borough will respond to an escalation of gang crime or growing domestic violence? 15 months training to decide how to risk assess and police an EDL, mosque, an EDL march past the local mosques? Or to decide the resources needed for homicide or to lead a team dealing with complex child protection issues, and 15 months training in order to police the riots or the response to terrorist threats. As a local resident in the community, I find that deeply troubling. And I would say to the government, I think they should listen up and ditch that plan and think again. The workforce of the future does need also to be more diverse. And in order to meet diverse challenges, in order to maintain the trust of local communities, and senior officers have told me they see diversity as crucial to their operational effectiveness, understanding communities they need to work with uh, and serve. So it is a problem that the work on diversity seems to have stalled, with too few women making it up the ranks, parents and carers finding their family-friendly working has been ditched as shifts are restructured to meet cuts, and too few black and minority ethnic officers being recruited, too few black and minority ethnic officers staying on. And that matters, because it means that we're losing the skills and talents that we need from our police forces as well. Around 5% of police officers in England and Wales are from an ethnic minority background, compared to around 14% of the population as a whole. And at the more senior level, there are 46 ethnic minority superintendents and chief superintendents on the latest figures. And that is the equivalent of around one per force, with few applying for promotion. So further action is needed because we're missing the talents and skills that the police force need. I think the government is not giving this issue sufficient priority. Every force should be required to have active policies in place for ethnic minority recruitment, retention and promotion so they can better draw on the talents of the whole community they serve. And those policies need energy behind them. Policing leaders such as Peter Fahey have argued that legislative changes are needed so that police forces are able to pursue effective targeted recruitment programmes to meet their operational needs and reflect their communities. Others have argued that more can be done within the existing legal framework. We were consulting now on what should be done, including looking at legislative changes too. And I want to highlight finally the problems for the police of keeping up with the new technology, using the sciences and forensics and using modern communication. As one former chief constable said to me, when he first started policing, the police were ahead of the game, 
With radio communications, they could move faster than criminals, faster than crowds, faster to help victims. Now, he told me, in his experience, the police can be outmaneuvered in a riot by BBM messages, as we saw two years ago, or finding using Google on a smartphone is more effective than police technology at getting them the rapid information they need. And unless we face up to the challenges and opportunities of new technology, policing will get stuck in the 20th century and not be able to keep up. But that requires national leadership, not leaving 43 forces to each pursue their own approach and each have to work it out on their own. And that, in the end, I think, does capture the challenge for all of us, because policing is the public service of last resort. You're the people we call when everything else goes wrong and everybody else has let us down. Your work keeps us safe, protects our freedom, and your work underpins the health and trust in our communities and the health and trust in public support for the rule of law and in our democracy as well. British policing has rightly been an exemplar for the world. But that's why we can't just stand back while policing is left with a 20th century model and 20th century technology while society moves on. And we can't just stand back while the government undermines some of the good things the police already do and is not yet providing the leadership that we need for the challenges of the future. And we should none of us be in any doubt. Policing is too important to fail, and we will not let it fail, and police officers across the country won't let it fail. Policing is too important to be left behind, and that resilience that many of you have worked so hard to build should not be undermined and put at risk. But I believe it can be built better for the future, even in the face of those new challenges, even in the face of difficult resource challenges, because actually we know we can do so by drawing on the talents of those officers and the ideas of those officers right across the country. But in order to do so, we need to work in partnership. We need everybody pulling together to support better policing for the 21st century. Thank you. I think we should have about uh, 10 minutes or so for questions, so please, please uh, sit your hand up. Gentleman down there, if you could, Nora could uh, hand the microphone to that gentleman there. Tell us who you are, sir. Thanks very much. Your um, I'm Chris Moon from Surrey. Um, you'd already alluded to the ability, or probably the inability, to hold police and crime commissioners to account for the performance between elections. Um, do you think, for the longer term, PCCs are with us? And if so, is that a good thing? This is something that we um, have specifically asked the uh, Stevens Review to look at. Uh, clearly, there has to be a framework for local accountability of policing. There has to be uh, an effective way to ensure that, local, that the police respond to local communities um, and uh, that there is intervention if things go wrong. The concerns we raised at the beginning about police and crime commissioners was, first of all, that... The uh, too much power is being concentrated in the hands of one person without sufficient checks and balances in the system, without sufficient oversight of what they do. Uh, and I think we have seen some examples of problems as a result of that, um, certainly in certain parts uh, of the country. Uh, we also raise concerns about how do you make sure, particularly with big forces, that um, you can't rely on one person to be the accountability mechanism to very diverse and varied communities. You need police officers, you need neighbourhood police officers responding to the communities in their area and their local estate and their ward uh, as well. So the question for us is what is the most effective way forward? We've seen in the work that uh, some of the PCCs have done, we have seen some of the problems around lack of checks and balances. We've also seen Seen some of the work that some of the PCCs have done around the partnership working, uh, some around uh, mental health and domestic violence and so on, that actually there is potential for greater working with local other, other organisations and so on. So, um, the, I mean, I'm going to effectively sort of disappoint you by not having a kind of clear uh, set of proposals that, um, that Labour would support at this stage because we want to see what the Stevens uh, review concludes and then we want to be able to consult on its proposals. But what we have said is we do believe that reforms will be needed uh, in order to address some of the concerns that we've raised. Do you regret going along with the idea? We didn't. Well, you put we opposed up. it. We voted against it in yeah. Parliament. But repeatedly. in the end, you put people no, up. No, we didn't. We, we put uh, Labour candidates to stand because yes. we were very concerned that otherwise there would be either Conservative candidates right across the country who had a very different approach to policing. For example, some of our candidates particularly campaigned on 
preventing some of the big contracting out of policing services. You remember the yeah. proposals in the West Midlands and Bedfordshire and so on to contract out large swathes of policing to companies like G4S and so on. So those were issues that our Labour candidates campaigned on, but we did oppose the original proposals through Parliament and voted against them. The challenge for us now is now that they are in place, what actually should the next steps be? And you're waiting for the Commission to tell you. And we will uh, do. Just go back to, to money. I keep going back to money this afternoon. I apologise for that. You said that the cuts were too speedy, they were too great. You'd have imposed cuts of only 12%. We heard Tom Windsor earlier this afternoon tell us, not that everything, everything's hunky-dory, but the fact remains crime is down, customer satisfaction is up. You were wrong, weren't you? I think that the policing cuts have gone too far and too fast. I think we've seen it, uh, as I said in the speech, in some of the wider problems. For example, the reduction in uh, the increase, sorry, in response times for 999, the reduction in domestic violence referrals to the courts. I think that is very serious. So I think we should welcome some of the reduction in the crime statistics and we should continue to do so. In fact, the reduction in, I think, the, the BCS crime statistics has been a much slower pace than it was in previous years, but we all want want the, to see reductions in the crime well, statistics. What do you, con what do you concede concern, about? My concern is that the, you're seeing the reduction in the quality of service as a result yeah. of the pace and scale of what the government has done. But what do you concede on the face of it, and this is what the public look at, it's been far more successful than you imagined? Well, I don't think that's... I think if you ask the public their concerns, I think that you will increasingly see the public... For example, the, the shopkeepers I referred to who I spoke to in Bedford who were actually were concerned about not having a town team anymore. Um, I think that, therefore, you'll see rising concern about lack of not having the neighbourhood teams on the streets that people want to see. And people do want to see crime fall. That is important. But they also want to feel safe and they want to see justice being done. And what it looks as though is happening is you're seeing a hollowing out of the criminal justice system, not just because of policing, but also some of the other things that are happening in the courts. A hollowing out of the criminal justice system, which looks as though actually you are less likely to get justice being done, you're less likely to have the cases going through the courts and less likely to have the action being taken, particularly on some of those serious crimes. Gentlemen over there, tell us who you are, sir. My name is uh, John Malloy. I'm Head of Professional Standards in uh, Kent Police. Uh, yesterday, The Independent published some of the comments that you've uh, made today with regards to BME staff, but also at the same time they published comments around the IPCC, uh, insofar that they've been running it for over a year now with Hillsborough, uh, criticism was uh, levelled at Keir Starmer. Is it time to rethink the IPCC? And if so, could I just add a little, what would you replace it with? Um, I think it is time to rethink the IPCC. We... Um Argued, uh, we argued about a year ago that the IPCC should be replaced with a new police standards authority, a, a new organisation. I think that um, the IPCC are clearly finding it difficult to cope with the scale of the Hillsborough investigation. I don't think that an approach which simply says the government will top slice a whole series, a load of money from professional standards and ethical uh, you know, organisations and complaints departments within each police force and take that into the centre is actually going to solve the problem because what you also need is more effective, more effective intervention at the local level when things go wrong in policing. And you know, this is partly about sort of maintaining, if in order for people to feel confident in the excellent work that police do, you've also got to know that when things go wrong, and sometimes things will go wrong, there is a very fast mechanism to be able to effectively sort things out. And at the moment, I don't think that the IPCC embodies that. I don't think it has the confidence that uh, the public need in it in order to be able to deliver those results. I mean, look, improvements have been made, and we press for it to get stronger powers, so they have been doing a lot of work, but I don't think that it's yet providing the effective approach. So it is one of the things we have also asked the Stevens Review to look at, is, look, if you were going to remodel this, if you were going to have a new approach to enforcement and intervention around uh, policing standards, what actually is the best way to do it? And it is something that I do hope that you and others will have put evidence into the Stevens Review on. How damaging do you think, uh, in terms of the police integrity and the police's reputation with the general public, how damaging do you think the events of, of Hillsborough, Plebgate, the unfortunate death of Mr Tomlinson, I could go on, but those are the three that strike stri me straight away, how damaging do you think they've been to the poli police integrity and police reputation? I think they do have an impact on public perception and public concern. 
I think, though, it's also um, important that often people will also uh, judge the policing by what they also see in their own experience. So they won't simply judge the policing on maybe the high-profile cases that they see in the media. They will also reflect on their own personal experience. And that's uh, why I think, for example, the neighbourhood policing is so important, because if you know that you've got a local effective police team, that you know who they are, you get on with them, and you can build that relationship, then that is an important way of demonstrating actually what the police are doing on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think there's no doubt that particularly, I mean, Hillsborough, what's so awful about Hillsborough is that it's taken, what, 20 years? to actually get to the truth about what happened. And nobody should have to wait 20 years for justice. You shouldn't have any system that can allow uh, cover-ups to take place for a long time. And that's why you've got to have an effective system to be able to investigate swiftly if and when things go wrong in order to put things right to maintain that confidence. I'm still looking for hands, by the way. In the oh, gentlemen down there, two gentlemen, get microphones to them. In the meantime, in Scotland, until they get their mics, in Scotland, we've got effectively a single force. Uh, do you see a case? Or do you see a, a case for continuing the situation in England and Wales, where we've got 43 different ones? Um, again, this is one of the specific issues that the Stevens Commission um, is looking at. And there's obviously, look, there's different levels of policing, different issues around policing that, um, that need to be done really at different levels. Uh, I've spoken, obviously, about the value of the neighbourhood policing, what needs to be done within the local, very local estate, community, town. There's also, I think, huge value to the work of borough commands and particularly where they are coterminous with a local council. If you've got a borough command working closely with a local council, that can have a really powerful impact within a local area. Above the borough command, there's then questions about some, areas, some things that can be done at force level, some things actually that should be done either if forces working together or at regional level or at national level. And one of the things that the Stevens Review is looking at is really what sort of things should be done at what level and what is the appropriate structure in order to support But them. in a word or two, do you think there's a case for more cooperation with technology, for example, with procurement, for example, it does seem balmy, the way things are operated at the moment. Yeah, completely. Look, you can't have it's the fragmentation, and I think that is the worry about the way in which the government set up the Police and Crime Commissioner reforms, is that there's been a danger of greater fragmenting rather than greater cooperation between forces. Okay. Uh, gentlemen, that tells you, your, sir. Yeah, Grenville Wilson from Sussex. Uh, I don't think you'll find uh, an organisation that won't work harder to protect people's rights to protest. However, you'll also find uh, an awful lot of people spending enormous amounts of time uh, managing those rights, often for single protest groups, uh, pursuing very long-term protests in very localised areas that are actually swaying resources, time and people away from uh, delivering those sort of neighbourhood policing and those sort of initiatives that you've mentioned already. How would you see those demands be managed better and actually the resourcing, particularly the financial resourcing, taken away from that local policing delivery? And actually I, pre I presume you're speaking as someone who's suffered fracking protests. It's taken a lot of my time. Yeah, OK, thank you. I say suffered advisedly. I'm, I'm not taking sides when I say that. They have every right to do it. Yeah, I mean, look, this is just hard, isn't it? That um, from time to time, issues emerge and there are strong public views, protests and so on. And it, um, it does reflect, I think, the, the point I made about, you know, we shouldn't ever underestimate the diversity of the challenges that the police need to face. You know, it's not simply about crime. It's also about public safety, public order, making sure that other organisations can go about their legitimate business and so on. So, I mean, look, the honest truth is this is just one of those difficult things that police officers, that superintendents have to balance. Uh, and there isn't, you know, there's no way we're going to reach a position where we sort of ban protests. And as you said, you know, the police would never uh, support uh, doing that either. We do, I think, have to, as communities, work to try and give people easier outlets for their protest and for their response so that people feel that they can do that through through local councils, through other local democratic processes as well. Um, but, you know, I am not going to pretend to you that that is an easy answer to the challenges that you're facing with direct demonstrations. What would you like to see them do? Do you know? I, I think... We need to, yeah, clearly we don't want to ban protest, but where these protests are going on and on against what, a, what is a legal uh, and, and a, a legitimate business that's been through legitimate processes to undertake its uh, activity, then uh, there has to be a, a question about whether the local force needs to, to manage those costs and actually whether there should be 
perhaps powers in place to actually impose tighter conditions. I think we've aired that one. Anyone else want to come in before we let Yvette go because she has to catch a train? Uh, Yvette, thank you very much indeed for being with us. Thank, thank you all you. for your questions. Um, I don't know, will we see you again as the Shadow Home Secretary next year or will we uh, expect to see you as one poll suggested yesterday as leader of the Labour Party? <laughs> Let's hope that the next time you see me, I'm Home Secretary, John. <laughs>